Welcome to another episode of IBC Oxford University Hot Topics in Surgery. I'm your host, Dr. Ariel Ortiz. We're broadcasting live from the International Bariatric Club Studios in San Diego, California. Today's IBC Oxford University Hot Topics in Surgery exclusive event in collaboration with Zoom Video Communication and Facebook is sponsored by Richard Wolf, Advanced Medical Solutions, Baxter, Conmed, and Bariatric News. The theme of the event today is Back to the Future. This webinar is streaming to millions of viewers from over 200 countries and territories through the International Bariatric Club, ibcclub.org. Via the Facebook Live to the IBC Facebook page, the IBC Twitter feed, LinkedIn, and via IBC Instagram. Mark your calendars for the 3rd International Bariatric Club Oxford University World Congress, September 23rd to the 25th of 2021. And don't forget to join us on July 7th when we present Augmented Reality Bariatric Endoscopy, Bariatric Surgery, and Integrative Medicine and an all-female panel of experts taking a deeper look into the newest technologies in our field. Today's event is organized by Dr. Harris Kuaja, Director of IBC Global Education based at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital London and Christchurch Oxford University, and will be chaired by myself and Professor Manuel Galvao Neto from Brazil. It will be moderated by Dr. Adriana Rotundo from the United Arab Emirates and Professor Santiago Jorgen from the University of California, San Diego. I would like to ask Professor Tomás Rogula, President and Founder of IBC, to welcome our viewers. Hi Ariel, hi my dear friends, IBC members. Uh, welcome to another episode of Hot Topics uh, in Surgery. Today we're gonna do something really special. We'll concentrate on very futuristic uh, advantages of uh, surgical innovations, which is extended reality and futuristic approach to GI endoscopy. Something that we learn uh, in the COVID era, but we'll probably stay with this for much longer time. So please enjoy uh, the program today and waiting for your questions and comments at the end. Thank you and have a nice program. Professor Galvao. Uh, hi, Ariel. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with, among, with, uh, with all of you again. And uh, we, uh, Tom asked uh, us to apologize to him because he have uh, an emergency situation, so he couldn't be here. So I'll take the lead. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you all uh, our dear professor, Safi Ahmed, that will talk to us about augmented reality and how they can uh, help us uh, in the pandemic times. So Professor Safi, it's an honor to have you here. Thank you very much. And the show is yours. Thanks so much for the introduction. And thanks so much to the uh, organization for inviting me to give a talk around extended reality. I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, we can start uh, the presentation. Hopefully it will work uh, as the technology will allow us. Now it's good to zoom that. Hopefully you can see all that in the widescreen. Perfect. Okay, so obviously, you know, we're in amazing times. Uh, obviously with the pandemic, we've seen the acceleration of technologies into clinical practice. Over the last five years, I've been involved in the whole aspects from uh, extended reality, from AR to VR to mixed reality, which we really in the moment, and also around holograms and avatars and holoportation. Those are the things I've been thinking about uh, in terms of how we uh, connect the world together to ensure that we offer suitable training and also offer the best for our patients. And we'll talk about that as we go through the system. The first thing I talk about, of course, is around this concept of the fourth industrial revolution, the technologies that are coming together at the same point of human existence to transform our lives. So we are living in amazing times. Uh, we are seeing the convergence of all these wonderful technologies, the same point of human existence. This is really a inflection point for humankind. We're seeing a change. What the pandemic has shown us is there's been a compression of time. Two to five years of work has been compressed to three months to show that we'll actually almost supercharge, uh, almost springboard the future, leapfrog our destiny by bringing these into reality as we speak. And all of these should be thought back together, not in isolation. How does blockchain affect AI, for example? How does AI and VR get affected by a 3D printing? It all kind of makes sense as a convergence of technologies. A brief summary, of course, of AI and VR, for those that don't know what it is, which I'm sure you do, but as a matter of principle, we'll just get through that very quickly. Augmented reality is where you have a glass in front of you, a screen. It could be a smartphone, it could be a wearable technology. We overlay information. 
similar to jet fighters who have the information overlaid to them to allow them to navigate through their um, through the flights. On the other side, on the right hand side, is virtual reality. This completely enclosed in the virtual world, we can't see the outside world. Completely different opposite ends of the spectrum. In the middle is the mixture, which is called mixed reality. We can actually see things. We also have this virtual component within that framework. An entire the same kind of area is called extended reality. Yeah, it summarizes and encompasses all of these technologies. Although they are uh, extreme at one or the other, they converge at the same point. <clears throat> so let's take an example through my own experience of what I thought was going to be the future. Let's get back six years, 2014. The Google Glass, as you remember, came out in 2012 to an amazing kind of um, interest uh, through the media around what it could potentially be used for. It was ahead of its time. It was a super smart glass, allowing you to use like a mobile phone sitting on your head. I was one of the first explorers. We got it. We used some software around it to see whether I could train people on a global level. One of my roles, I'm a cancer surgeon, a colorectal. I know I shouldn't be in the bariatric uh, uh, kind of a forum, but here we are as a lower GI surgeon uh, and thinking about the future. So I'm a trainer. I'm a teacher like all of us on this forum. And I was thinking about how do we teach our medical students, our trainees, a different way? Can we actually change the paradigm of learning in the operating theatre? So we got the Google Glass back in 2014. I streamed the world's first operation globally using Google Glass. Uh, so with a, with a single voice command, I could stream live. People on their smartphones could watch the operation in real time on their smartphone. They could also text message, which would come from the augmented reality display that I was watching, and I could answer it in real time, interact with them. On that day, oops, on that day, I taught about 14,000 people across the globe. Just a simple operation, streamlined through a 3G connection. And we literally reach all parts of the world. On the bottom right of your screen, you'll see John Scully. John Scully is the CEO of Apple, the ex-CEO who you will recall was the guy who sacked Steve Jobs. He's a friend of mine, and we taught him how to do a simple operation remotely using Google Glass technology and mobile phone technology, which obviously is where we connect at the moment through every part of the world. And my work is really around democratizing healthcare, democratizing education, and scaling the kind of learning that we wish to foster for ourselves. AR is now taking a new fold. We know both on Apple and Android, we have Apple, we have platforms that support AR. We are seeing medical schools now being transformed and the anatomy teaching entirely in augmented reality. So soon we'll be seeing this kind of juxtaposition of technology from the new and the old anatomy teaching, which can be superseded by augmented reality displays. It makes it far easier. You can connect with many people around the world together and share knowledge in that scale. And of course, the access point is very cheap, requires a smartphone technology. What about going forward in the operating theatre? There are a number of companies now working on platforms that allow you to perform augmented reality within the operating theatre. This is Apple Clark, who are now working on images you can overlay, for example, here in the skull, go to images, and hopefully that allow you to plan preoperatively surgery, particularly useful in spinal surgery, orthopedics, for example, and neurosurgery, but also about planning the treatment during the operation. Imagine fixing a fracture. This is uh, from Aki Sugimoto, who's a friend of mine from uh, Japan, who's been working on hollow eyes. So using real-time images overlaid into the human body using the Microsoft HoloLens, see whether we can actually pinpoint structures. It's a bit rudimentary. It's not perfect. It's going to get better. Obviously, there's point, problems with position of patient. Uh, things might not be in the right place at the right time. But it's an indication, for example, in the future, we may be able to dissect out a cancer with all the vessels around it, all the anatomy, much more, um, uh, I guess, accurately than we have before. It's certainly going to help us improve our diagnostic skills um, and also improve, hopefully, our surgical skills, which need a change of direction. You may think this is kind of far-fetched, not at all. A year ago, one year ago, the FDA approved two of these platforms to be used routinely in surgery. So now we've got the green light to use these technologies in real time. And now we're seeing a kind of um, a mini explosion, if you like, of interest given the pandemic and what it's created. That was augmented reality, which is amazing and has a huge potential in our professional surgery. What about the other extreme of virtual reality? This is a picture we took of myself about four or five years ago when I did the world's first virtual reality operation, again, transmitted to the world. So where augmented reality is that you're remote, it's like telemedicine in some ways, with VR, you can bring the audience to you. What about if you could drag people from all around the world 
into your VR space and actually connect with them and teach them on a global level. How about sharing experience in virtual reality and where that, will that take us? So we did the world's first operation. This was back in 2016. And I transmitted the first VR operation using uh, a camera system we configured ourselves. We used Google Cardboard so people could watch it on their smartphone at home around the world. So it was cheap. I, it only cost a few dollars for anybody. The free, with a smartphone and free app, they can access my operation. On that day, I took 55,000 people around the world with a single operation of cancer. And they can literally, just with a smartphone and app uh, with a Google Cardboard, access the operation. immersion to people around the world using a low-cost technology, simple VR headsets, to actually immerse themselves in a place around the world. Then we expanded. I have a number of companies. One of them is a mixed VR company, uh, and we've developed the world's first training platform in VR. So what we're doing with this, of course, is that we're creating a kind of unique experience with, with shared learning through surgical operations, uh, through OSCEs, through undergrad and postgrad training, and at the moment, we just pushed out all of our platform over the last three years. We were the world's first company to push out the VR platform for learning. It's intuitive. We know that from VR's perspective, that learning is better. Some reports estimate that you retain 80% more information through immersive education. We're seeing now expansion to schools, for example, now get a lot of interest from around the world. So now that we are in the pandemic, we're offline, how can we train people using both immersive technology in this case, virtual reality. We can go to the operations, we can create 360 environments, we can interact with videos, creating a learning experience that's much more effective than previously would imagine. Three years ago, this was to be far-fetched and science, science fiction. Now, people are crying out for a new kind of way of learning. So this is quite irrelevant. We've also pushed down to training for OSCEs, for example. Here we are, training people at OSCEs, where you can actually now navigate through training procedures. So you can assess people and be remote assessment using virtual reality training. This is obviously just a training for uh, an OSCE examination, which I think will fundamentally change the way we examine our future generation of medical students, doctors, and of course, our own surgeons. Of course, VR is also useful in the operating theater. This is Touch Surgery, who are an amazing company based in London, who have created loads of tours around um, uh, kind of the touch interface on iPad and smartphone, also into immersive tech. So you can now re create surgical procedures. Imagine doing a gastric bypass uh, virtually first and foremost, learning techniques, learning how to behave in the environment before going to the OR. It will save time and make it far more efficient, of course. And then you can see the anatomy, figure out where you need to make cuts, et cetera, and place implants. And also VR company that a friend of mine called Justin Barad runs is now going to the next level, actual training in VR. This makes sense it's about reproducing uh, parts of the operation, going to systematic fashion, learning, and been reproducing that before we get to the OR. And so they've really shown this been an effective way of learning how to operate. And we're creating a lot of these in general surgery from my company at the moment, which we've released over the next year or so. The last thing I'll talk to you about is really futuristic. It's this whole concept of the doctor-patient relationship. We know that we often have to have face-to-face -face consults, but with the pandemic, we've seen a rise in telemedicine up to 5,000% more. I never thought we'd get to the position, but as I said before, we've leaped from reality. So everyone now expects a different way of learning. This picture from 924 shows the radio doctor, what they described back 100 years ago, actually described telemedicine. My view is how do we create MDTs? How do we create training remotely? How do we connect, even though we're kind of in different parts of the world? So we did this about two years ago. We used the HoloLens to connect three surgeons from New York, from India, in Mumbai, in London, into the same operating theater and sharing images. This could be the future of MDT or remote assisting in theater. So the Hollands itself really allows us to reshape the way we connect people, we communicate with people, also to be used in teaching and training. 
Initially, when we put the whole lens on, it feels a bit strange, but actually, in a few minutes, it becomes quite normal. It feels like we're just discussing cases with people the same way, for example, like we do in normal active practice. We can come in and actually look at the content in 3D. And obviously, when you're working in, in this case, the medical field, having a full 3D understanding of the situation, for example, is really much more powerful in solidifying how you want to navigate in your mind. So those are blue avatars looking at how we connect uh, using reconstructed images. This is obviously a friend of mine called James Kinross, who recently used the MR during the pandemic this to be able to see patients. With a difference, those hand gestures are controlling a mixed reality headset. The doctor can bring up x-rays and scans. Thank you very much. And the rest of the medical team can stay in a non-COVID area, sharing a live feed of everything he sees. So we're seeing that now because of no touch, because of the fact the pandemic has persuaded us to be uh, uh, kind of do virtual consults, etc., uh, and no physical contact. Suddenly, we're seeing a real um, drive to this kind of technology, and this is uh, over the last few months, of course. My real ambition was to transport myself, and the process by called holoportation. How can you transport yourself in real time? Go from one place to the other. I do a lot of work globally. Uh, I've been to 30 countries the last five years working with various governments uh, as part of my role at the college, etc. And um, also I work in conflict zones where you can't get in without an enormous amount of effort and, and stress and pressure and risk to people. So how do we do this? So we try to create our own image in 3D using photogrammetry, a bunch of cameras, recreate 3D model, adding AI, voice technology, so that that becomes a living human being and becomes what we call a digital human. And that may be the way in the future we democratize health and education. Over the last few months during the pandemic, we did this. We took that avatar, put into mixed reality, and this is what we did a few months ago with my friends from, again, America and also in London. Hey, guys, I'm in uh, downtown Atlanta right now. Thanks for joining me. I forgot my magic leaf, but I've got my phone in handy, so I'm joining you through here. Thanks for joining us. Should we have a look at some images to help us in this regard? Let's uh, try to have just a front image of the um, uh, virus itself, just to show you what it looks like. So it's essentially countries across here. These are China, Iran, Italy, and South Korea. As well as showing you the infections and confirmed cases are on this side here. Okay, sadly, this is obviously the most worrying part of it. These are the deaths that have it. Sadly, these are high incidence of death rate uh, compared to normal flu for the coronavirus. And we're seeing, again, how the death in China uh, being managed have uh, come to a kind of plateau. Well, hey, thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks thanks for so much for joining us. Thanks for joining us from the best part of the world, from Atlanta, from New York. So we did that two months ago, showing that actually we've moved on so rapidly. We now can use almost lifelike avatars with facial movements and facial uh, expressions. What about actually transmitting yourself? This was Hollow Portal uh, by a company called Double Me. Forget avatars and recreation. This could be transporting you. We did this about uh, two years ago. Shafi, have a look at this. Yeah, let me have a look over your shoulder. Oh yeah, I see what's going on there. I think I can give some advice, Carl. No problem. Thanks for calling me. So what you've seen really with this, I'm going to go back to stop share, is the fact that we've come a long way. I said for us that compression of time. We've we've catapulted the whole of the future early. We're seeing more adoption. We're seeing less regulation problems, less bureaucracy, less barriers to adoption. We're seeing fast translation. And we're now seeing the medical community say to us, let's think differently. We're not going to go back. We're going to be virtual going forward. And I think more and more this will be applicable to more specialties. And we've got to think outside the box. We want exponential thinkers to redesign and reimagine healthcare. And I think extended reality is just one part of that entire jigsaw. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that. Thanks very much. I'm happy to take some questions at some point during the conversation. Thank you very much, Safi.
And now we, uh, we have here, and I saw that Santiago has uh, really uh, watched your presentation with uh, interest. And, uh, and uh, I will leave you, give you to Santiago to comment on your presentation. And that was really, really astonishing to us. Yeah, that, that was absolutely awesome, uh, really uh, right on point. And, and what a timing now, right? Uh, I think that, you know, we, we have all been dreaming about uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning and, and virtual presence. And, and, and I think that now with the pandemic, we can see that that's more need than ever. Um, I think that one of the big futures is, is, is the ER, right? The emergency room when the patient comes in yeah. and I don't know if they have COVID-19 or not. And that's when people get infected and, and then the operating room. So how, how do you see this technology helping in those two areas? You know, when, when we receive those patients that we call them the enemies in a way, right? You don't know if they are infected or not infected. They come in and are, everybody is scared and, and, and suddenly they are negative and everybody is, is, is more more relaxed and yeah. I have seen it here. Uh, how, how, how do you see this, this, this technology helping first when we approach the patient for the first time and then in the operating room? Yeah, really good question. So one of the things, um, thanks Santiago so much for the kind words. And look, about three or four years ago, I was doing all these kind of experiments, pushing the boundaries. And we weren't quite ready. There was some anxiety around it. The worry was about patient uh, feedback, is it engagement? Uh, are we changing the way that we communicate around empathy, human touch? And we know that we all kind of sit in clinics and there's that kind of human side of things. But now we're ready for that change where the public is saying, the patient's saying, we don't mind being remote. Who, who would have thought three months ago we'd be breaking bad news remotely through telephone or virtual or a virtual consult? No one would have imagined it, right? In fact, you'd have been criticized heavily for breaking bad news for a cancer patient, but now it's become a normal. So I think that's the important part. Patients, I think we've been really underestimating the patient's perspective and how ready they are for change. We've seen now they are ready. That's the first change. In terms of ER, there's no question. What I was doing this work three years ago, we were using Google Glass in A&E at the time. So a trauma triage was managed by one person wearing the glass, could communicate to the rest of the team, also feed information from the ambulance coming in with information about the patient in real time. That could also be done in the COVID pandemic. It makes it much easier. And if you can avoid the, the contact at the moment, it makes sense for the pandemic. In theatres, I see great utilization. We're seeing the best use cases from surgeons, probably because we've always been innovative. We always wanna push that boundary, but it kind of makes sense. Whether we're planning operations physically, we have MRI scans, images we need to relate to and to get all the uh, information for electronic health record makes sense. Look, the future operating theatre will be voice tech enabled, right? There will be only voice enabling the theatre. You'll be using some of these devices to get information. But one thing I must stress though, very important Santiago, is that um, it, you can't operate with these headsets. There's a paper that came out last year saying that it actually makes the eyesight worse because obviously you can't see what's in front of you. And be very careful about saying this is applicable just now. We have to be very careful about studies. It's good for planning. It's good for preoperative care during the operation. During the operation, we have to be more cautious. Are we ready? Is visualization good enough? Uh, I don't think it's just yet. So a bit of caution there. There's no question that the companies now have get FDA approval. They're in the operating theater already, implementing the change. I think the next 12 months, we'll see uh, kind of a gradual inc uh, incline now in the utilization and the data to support it, you know, in terms of series of patients, et cetera, cases that have gone well with good data. So that's kind of where I'm at with that, Santiago. Yeah, that's, that's really awesome. You know, I, I think that all these technologies and what we were doing in, in AI and, and visual presence was kind of a slow because of lack of funding, because yeah. people didn't understand the importance. And now Zoom became the, the, <laughs> the super advanced technology. And I think that what we're going to see in the future, I don't know if you agree, is way much more funding from industry and, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and governments to really fund this yeah. virtual presence and, and, and what you guys are doing. And I really congratulate you for that. So it, this is truly incredible. Thank um, you. Manolo or, or yeah. Adriana? Uh, uh, Adriana, you want to, to make any comment? You, Adriana, you are on mute. You are, you are muted. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes. 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 Hey, fantastic presentation, Professor Shafi. 
really incredible the future in front of us. What I wanted to ask you is, um, first of all, if you think that uh, uh, extended reality can make surgery safer, so reduce the risk of complication, and then uh, how you can get this kind of technology in the hospital, what kind of costs will uh, this include? Uh, very good question. So I, I think there's a couple of things. Look, I think um, certainly it will support, it will augment, um, and it may improve our diagnostics uh, preoperatively inside the OR. Uh, we would have more information at, at fingertips. I think that will certainly help. It's hard to prove the benefit at the moment, but potentially mm -hmm. there's a benefit. I think people at Touch Surgery who are now looking at AI interfaces, and I'm sure you've seen it with their uh, operations on screen, which allow you to navigate through the procedure, using the team around you, showing what's next, looking at structures that are important in the operation. And I think what it allows us to do for the first time is objectively measure a surgeon's performance. At the moment, it's subjective. How you perform, the outcome, the complications, right? Actually, if you had much more data in the operating theater about what you're doing, the movements you're making, hundreds of thousands of data points, and assistance on the screen on laparoscopic surgery, showing where yeah. to guide you, that's gonna definitely improve our outcome and gives more data-driven healthcare system to allow each surgeon to be performing better and assess themselves around those points, which we don't have at the moment, it's just subjective. So I think that's a good move. Um, and that will take time, of course, to get the data and the trials ready. But I, I can't see any reason why we shouldn't um, do this. Costs, of course, are going to be managed by relationship about the cost between patients, saving money, reducing complications ultimately, allowing navigation, reducing errors. So this thing could, for example, in the future, um, reduce the uh, never events, OK, for example. One of my companies I work with are now looking at instrument trays. So you can take a snapshot picture with computer vision. It shows you what's on the tray during the operation. Take one picture. Rather than counting, recounting, counting those instruments in real time, it'll tell you what's missing. That will save never event, surely. So those kind of, I think we have to think about the uh, ways we save money in terms of investment. But also, as Santiago says, at the moment, huge investment's going through. Everyone's saying, yes, invest. It's the right time. We're happy. We have an open door for six months or a year while the pandemic's with us. Just use that opportunity, drive change, because we're not going back. We're not going back. <laughs> That's the thing. Okay, thank you. I have, I have a question for you from, from the audience. Uh, how, how do you see this technology being introduced in developing countries? Uh, really good question. And I think that's a fundamental question to ask. And um, what, we, what we're seeing, I think, is a democratization of healthcare, okay? A democratization of education, which we'll all try to do. And what I would show with this technology is you can connect with people. If you have a 3G, 4G connection, which most people have, 60% of the world have a smartphone at the moment, and that will rise in the next three, four years. Suddenly everyone's connected. So this is the ability to share knowledge on a global scale. When I was, when I was for example, using VR, I had 50,000 people connecting, all right? Teaching on a single operation. That makes sense, right? It's scaling up. So, and the cost will come down. Although tech is expensive at the moment, as time goes on, what we want is high tech, but low cost. That's the way to get out to the world. So if you imagine telemedicine on a smartphone, that's taken a huge leap into democratizing access to a doctor, whether it's Babylon, Rwanda, and others. Suddenly we're seeing that. In China, their Ping An telemedicine platform has access to 300 million users six months ago. Now it's probably half a billion with about 300, uh, 100, 200,000 consultations per day. Suddenly we're seeing, actually, we can access healthcare more affordably, more cheaply. So this is why I think technology will make us more human, will allow us to be much fairer in society. And it's, although it's not the answer or the solution, it's an enabler, it supports, it augments our practices. And that's the kind of discussion we'll be having, I think, um, maturely uh, about the future of healthcare. And, you know, just, just to finish, I think that you are dead on, because now, now we are accepting this technology. Yeah. You know, we physicians are accepting. The patients love it. My patients love not to come to clinic. They just love being at home. I mean, they probably I'm having seven stars in one to five now. <laughs> so I see that you're dead on. And congratulations on an incredible, incredible presentation. You blow everybody away. Okay, really that's really kind. Thank you so much. Really kind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Safi and uh, uh, Wendy, your, your part here and saying to you that uh, revolution has come. So now we are on telemedicine. I'll, I'll give you uh, 
uh, what I'm witness that now I'm inside everybody wars. So I'm helping my uh, residents. I'm actually doing teleproctoring and telementoring in three different countries using Zoom, simple video cards, uh, uh, iPhones. And I remember when we started using the Google Glass in US that we proctor for, in, in Braham remembers that, we proctor for intragastic balloon 2015, you know what? Okay, we had to yeah. stop because it was not HIPAA compliant. Yes, yes, of course. You see? <laughs> That's so what I remember. Just, just to congratulate you, I think the revolution starts. Santiago, what beautiful words you just said that. And uh, I think we are all embracing because we are ready now. We are never yeah. ready than now. And I don't see any, any going back. So with that words, I will, I will go to the next presenter of our session and my pleasure, uh, my honor. And I'm very pleased to introduce to you all Professor Bahama Budaye from Mayo Clinic that we are personal friends. And he'll talk to us about something that you see. And uh, I'll call Adriana just uh, after that to, to comment on that. And Abraham, we are facing a really jeopardy time for our endoscopic procedures. We and the dentists, we are among the most aerolized uh, generated procedures in the world. And this is the virus that is spread by the air. So we are here and we are anxious, uh, anxious to, uh, to watch your presentation to see what you guys are doing in Mayo that can help us uh, to protect ourselves and our patients with that. Braham. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel. Uh, thank you for, for the organizer on this wonderful, wonderful webinar. I tremendously enjoyed Professor Chaffee. It's, it's wow. It's out of this world. Uh, I think the future is here for sure. Uh, I will share my screen. So we're going to talk about futuristic strategies to, minimal, to minimize aerosolization during GI endoscopy. You could replace endoscopy and say laparoscopy. I think the concept applies any procedure that generates aerosols. This is a relevant topic. I'm going to start with the obvious and quickly go into the less obvious and the, fur and the futuristic approach that are quite disruptive and challenge the status quo about what we do. So as a background, uh, it's important to clarify what's a droplet and what an aerosol. It's, it's usually it's a continuum. Droplets are particulates or particles that are above 20 microns in size. Aerosols are smaller droplets that are under 10 microns in size, uh, in size. And there's important implication about survival in the air and distance traveled based on this designation and the spectrum of sizes. Your average uh, surgical mask will prevent uh, acquisition of, uh, of particles in the neighborhood of 2 to 10 uh, microns. Uh, there's a lot of hype about the N95, and people are fighting to get N95. And the N95s prevent acquisition of particles between 0 0.1 and 0 0.3 mic microns at 95% efficiency. To put that in perspective, the novel coronavirus that we're dealing with have a size of 0 0.12 uh, microns. That's why it's recommended that we use N95 in high-risk uh, procedures. So this is a simulated cough uh, published in JAMA, which has a mixture of aerosolized particles and droplets. You could see that the bigger droplets automatically start dropping quickly uh, with, uh, with, the, with, with gravity. But you could see the, 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 the trajectory or length that these droplets and, and aerosols could travel. So if you look at the characteristics of the particle or, or aerosol, uh, aerosols, you could see that the smaller the particle, the longer it survives in the air and the longer it travels. So you could see that particles on the order of 0 0.5 microns could last or survive in a stagnant air circulation room up to 41 hours compared to droplets that sinks down to surfaces very quickly within uh, seconds. 
this is a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine that compared the SARS-CoV-2 virus compared to the older SARS-CoV-1 virus and looked at the uh, surface stability of the virus over hours. And you could see on a surface that this virus could uh, sit uh, on the surface for about uh, three hours. So there's a lot of talk about how could we uh, improve clearance of these aerosols and, and, and particles. Uh, and for that, it's important to understand the dynamic of air circulation within a room. So you could see here on uh, the x-axis time and on the y-axis concentration of the particle. And you could see in a stagnant air circulation, there is a lag phase uh, before the droplets are cleared from uh, the circulation. With a turbulent or laminar flow room, you could see that there's an exponential decrease with time uh, of these particles. That's why this is a key metric and key differentiator of, uh, of room turnaround uh, is how uh, is, is the aerodynamic uh, characteristics of flow within the room. So why aerosol mitigation is important? Because I could, the recommendation now is to use full set of gears uh, for aerosolized uh, producing procedures. And that quickly, if you start applying this to millions of procedures that gonna deplete our PPE reserves, uh, there is a downtime for room turnaround, uh, factoring in room circulation and the amount of particle or aerosolized produced so that's a significant loss of efficiency uh, uh, for procedural type or surgical type practice. So what are some of the strategies that we could use to mitigate aerosolization during these procedures? And again, here, we're going to start with the obvious and go with less of the obvious and the futuristic, futuristic, futuristic approaches. So one of the strategy is to optimize air circulation within the room. Here in the figure, you could see a source of aerosolization, and you could see a typical OR or procedure room with a typical air circulation, and the air is flowing from above down to the air return unit. And you could see these are the counts, the particle counts at different areas. You could see here is there is, let's say this is an OR table or a procedural table. You could see at two minutes, there's about 996 particles. You could see at the bed or the wheels of the bed where, where gravity pulls things down, there's a high concentration of particles. Six inch high, the particles goes down and there is increased concentration at air return. So maximizing air dynamic circulation is one of the key premise of how do we minimize procedure turnaround times and, and, and return back to a semi-normal uh, procedure flow as we uh, uh, are accustomed to prior to COVID. And you could see here uh, with, with, with good air circulation, time to go, to go down to a background particle count of about 700 is about 15 minutes when you have optimal air circulation within the room. So that's one key strategy uh, in order to mitigate the risk of aerosolization is to maximize the air dynamics within the room. The second is physical barriers, and there's a lot of work and a lot of innovation around physical barriers for procedures that do generate aerosolization. I'm gonna focus here on endoscopy. And this was reported actually uh, as a lecture in the New England Journal of Medicine where they used a simple box in order to uh, decrease uh, the spread of droplets and aerosols. And this is nothing more than a simple plexiglass box where the anesthesiologist could intubate the patient under the box and the proceduralist could do their endoscopy uh, adjacent uh, uh, to that box as well. And you could see just a simple mechanical barrier could prevent significant spread of their aerosolization, but it's definitely is a crude way and it's not, not perfect. So we've been working together with an innovative team here at Mayo led by Dr. Naftej Buttar in order to collaborate with anesthesia and surgery to figure a way to make procedures that go through the mouth quite safer. So they created this special mask and this, I'll orient you to this mask. This mask is, is uh, just like an oxygen mask fits into the patient's mouth and nostrils. There is two uh, air seal uh, valves, one that could accommodate an ET tube and the other one could accommodate a gastroscope. 
And there is here a HIPAA uh, high efficiency filter, and there is suction uh, cannula above here uh, in order to create not only a barrier, but to actively clear the droplets and particles before they have time to circulate into the uh, room. So uh, th this is the model that we studied this in. We created a model of high aerosolization uh, using a fluorescein dye uh, within a nebulizer. Uh, and we used an aerosol uh, particle measure uh, in order to count particles uh, both within the mask, within the box, and within the room after stimulated aerosolization uh, with this model. Here is the model that we tested. We used both the uh, standard box, then we use this what we call the AMG uh, device, and we also enhance the standard box by uh, introducing laminar flow within it. So you can see on one end of the box, we added a, a, a suction uh, in order to create a laminar flow within the box as an added layer of screening aerosolization before spreading into the room. Uh, so here is the fully simulated model. You could see that the ET tube is uh, in the patient uh, airway. Here is the endoscope uh, is through the second orifice going into the patient's esophagus. Here is the suction with the filter. And now this is a closed procedure that would uh, hypothetically minimize aerosolization altogether. Uh, this is a standard setup where the anesthesiologist on the head of the patient monitoring everything uh, in, in an open fashion, and the uh, endoscopist is uh, scoping the uh, patient through the uh, air seal uh, opening within the mask. So if you look at the Pexiclass aerosol box with a laminar flow alone, uh, here uh, you could see that the laminar flow is turned off. This is the baseline uh, part particle count. The sensor here for particle counting is in the room, and you could see that the, uh, though it decreased the particle count, the box by itself is not perfect. Even if you put a laminar flow within it, as the particle count almost doubled uh, after stimulated cough uh, in the room with only the uh, box uh, alone. Now, if you add the box with the AMG device uh, on top of the uh, patient uh, mouth and nostril, we did the experiment where you started with a, uh, with a simulated cough to create aerosolization. You could see that the droplet count goes from 500 to uh, uh, excess of 100,000. Then we turned on the uh, box laminar flow alone. You could see that there's some clearance, but it takes it down by half, not back to the uh, background level uh, of particle clearance in the room. Then we turned on the AMG flow and simulated the same aerosolization. You can see within 30 seconds, the aerosol count within that area decreased back to background level, indicating the efficacy of this combined technique in getting you uh, to a background uh, aerosol levels within a procedure room within a few seconds, uh, which could enhance room turnaround and safety for the patient. This is the, uh, the mask, and you can see the aerosolized without the active suction being uh, all turned on. And you could see once the active suction is turned on, there is even with a, a, a less of an ideal seal on the patient, there is clearance of the uh, particles. So now we're gonna go from the obvious, we said mechanical barriers, airflow dynamics, to the less obvious. Uh, the future now, which could be uh, uh, enhanced and we could get there quicker in the post-COVID era is potentially in the robotics. So if you have a procedure that generates aerosolization, could you have the operator and the team sitting in a separate room conducting complex uh, natural orifice procedures and interventions? Uh, robotics have definitely uh, multiple advantages, including precision, including image guidance and artificial uh, augmented reality, as, as, as we saw from Professor Schaaf's lecture. There's enhanced imaging, there is the capability of learning and digital in uh, insights and, uh, and, uh, and monitoring uh, for quality metrics. So we have now multiple uh, uh, platforms that would allow 
such a concept within Natural Orifice. This is one of the platforms is by Medrobotics uh, that will allow us to perform uh, complex interventions robotically and possibly in the near future virtually uh, as well, where the operator could be uh, separated from uh, the patient. Here's, for example, a, a, a complex ESD. You could see that the robotic uh, arms are performing the injection uh, left to allow for the resection. Uh, again, the operator does not need to be in a close proximity uh, to the patient. You could see that the triangulation with an endoscopy is a new thing that will allow us to perform complex intervention like removing superficial tumors with ease and with, with ability to provide uh, counter traction and efficient cutting uh, in order to remove uh, difficult lesion such as this one. Now, this is a posterior uh, ESD or endo, uh, submucosal, endoscopic submucosal dissection. How about something that is on a difficult uh, area uh, like an anterior ESD? This is again showing that with the robotic arms, not only that the operator could be uh, remote from uh, the patient, but also you could perform uh, tasks that are with uh, very difficult and complex with current endoscopic tools and techniques. This is a posterior ESD. Uh, you're working a bit backward here. And now we're gonna use the same robotic system in order to backhand suturing in order to close a big defect that was uh, generated uh, during this procedure. Here, the lesion is removed, and now you're using the suturing techniques uh, in order to uh, perform a, uh, endoscopic uh, robotic assisted suturing, uh, which is a concept that is uh, it's new and novel uh, that will not only provide you a remote ability to do this, but also it gives you the precision to do it uh, in a difficult uh, location that only robotics uh, could provide. This is not the only system. There is another system based on uh, uh, the University of Texas in, uh, in Houston uh, that uh, Manuel is very familiar with, and they're, uh, they're uh, studying its indications in Brazil uh, as we speak. But both of these systems still require the operator to be in the vicinity of the patient or the robot in order to perform the intervention. What's the future? Now there is there's a system by Oris, uh, recently acquired by Johnson & Johnson, that could allow you to do this uh, intervention using a joystick. You do not need to be uh, in, in any uh, proximity to the patient. You could be in a separate room or uh, through a virtual reality. You could use, use one of these goggles uh, that Dr. Shafi uh, showed us, and you could be sitting uh, like playing a video game and uh, performing complex endoscopic intervention using a robotic platform. Uh, so definitely the future is progressing along these arms. Now, new uh, novels, again, we're gonna talk from obvious, less obvious to futuristic. Uh, new uh, paradigms is why don't we make the endoscopic procedures more efficient? Do we need to spend an hour uh, cutting a tumor? Could we ablate the tumor with high efficiency? And that's what we're thinking about here. We're thinking about new energy modality to enhance the efficiency of the procedures, especially procedures that could generate aerosolization. And the, the new kid on the block in this area is electroporation. Uh, electroporation is a really a paradigm shift that we're, we're starting to learn from the field of electrophysiology or cardiology where you generate a high voltage electrical field, but only for nanosecond. So rather than ablating a tissue with coagulative necrosis, you ablate the tissue by creating holes in the phosphobilayer membranes of the cell uh, where the tissue lies through apoptosis. So you could ablate a large surface area with high safety margins without affecting extracellular matrix or sensitive blood vessels or the pancreas or, or what have you in this, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, paradigm. So the paradigm here again is using high voltage nanosecond pulse in order to avoid thermal, thermal injury and ablate large surface areas with non-thermal, non-contact uh, methods. And uh, so could we take a procedure that is cumbersome, like endoscopic submucosal dissection, where it takes a couple of hours to remove large lesions, 
And could we now snap it with a press of the button? You could ablate the same large region without exposing the room, your patient, and your staff to a two hours procedure. Here is the traditional ESD. You could see there is a superficial gastric cancer. The operator spended an extended procedural time to do a beautiful job removing this lesion and dissecting to the submucosa. But could we use the same? Could we now dial in this electrical field that we could design it and model it to do what we want? And with a zip of a button, you could see that we here, this is the half of the uh, hollow structure, which is the duodenum in this case, you could see that half of it is not ablated because this is the control, but with one push of a button, you could ablate an entire half of this, uh, of this duodenum without the need for surgery or therapeutic endoscopy, and that is part of the future. Now going to the less obvious is novel therapeutics, and instead of physically removing a lesion or ablating a lesion, could we use this concept of oncolytic virus therapy, where we, uh, we, uh, we uh, rig a virus, it could be COVID for that matter, that we change its RNA and now it has an oncolytic function where the virus infects the tumor cells. So you deliver the virus locally to a cancer and let the virus kill the tumor uh, without the need of surgery or procedures for the, or, or simple procedure for that matter. And the, along the same concept is CAR T therapy, where you take natural killers within the body, which is the T cells, and you put a receptor on it that it targets specific tumors. And now this becomes a killer uh, for the tumor and you avoid aerosolizations altogether. With that, I conclude. I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to uh, be participant of this uh, very futuristic uh, webinar, and I'm humbled uh, to, uh, to participate. Thank you so much. Okay, that was fantastic. fantastic. <laughs> We've got some questions from uh, for uh, Professor Baram. First of all, it was a fantastic presentation. Like at the Mayo, you are 10 years ahead of us. <laughs> fantastic, really. So we've got a few questions for you. The first one is from Australia. And is, do you think after the COVID-19 pandemic is over, will op all upper GI endoscopic procedure require full PPI as a standard? or we expect to go back to pre-COVID area? Yeah, I think with, uh, with innovations uh, such as the ones I've shown you and others that will come to the pipeline, uh, uh, we are gonna come into a pre-COVID area. And so the innovation this seed are on multiple levels. One is we have better testing, both PCR and serologic for COVID. Now we're heading toward point of care finger prick testing for COVID. So now, yeah. number one, to eliminate a lot of COVID before it reached the procedural unit. Once in the procedural unit, because all these tests still have false positive or false negative rate. So now we're gonna work on mechanical barriers to minimize the risk of aerosolization and we're gonna work on room dynamics. So I don't think we're gonna require full PPE down the line. We were gonna learn how to adjust our procedural flow and our testing strategy in order to go back to the same efficiencies as pre-COVID. Uh, it will take technology and time, but I think we're heading there. Fantastic. There is another question also. Will future endoscopic procedures require a gastroscope with a smoke extraction system like the one we use for laparoscopy, like the ConMed system? So the question is, would it require a, a, a laparoscope with tip deflection? Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah Abraham, uh, I think that uh, what they are referring to is that when we use, uh, we do procedures that generate smoke, like uh, the apply APC, for example, that's a lot of uh, smoke generator organization. Uh, and uh, I think the question is, we will need some smoke evacuator, a lot like laparoscopy yeah. and endoscopy. Yeah, yeah, uh, that, that's, that's an excellent question. The, the, uh, the advantage of the scope uh, is it's a closed system. And when you generate 
uh, when you generate uh, clouds like with APC argon plasma coagulation, you could evacuate it with a suction of the scope without creating aerosolization because it comes from a deep cavity. Uh, however, even stuff that comes from the mouth, hopefully with mechanical barrier, barriers like the AMG device, that these will be cleared uh, automatically at that level before generating uh, aerosolization. However, I'm sure there's a lot of innovation on how to increase the efficiency of suctioning within the tip of the endoscope. So I think we're gonna see uh, development in that end as well. So Abraham, this was a fantastic presentation that you just open up uh, and blow up our minds and that's uh, uh, out of this world. So, uh, mm -hmm. What do you see in the future? And let uh, and I know that when you think about what you're doing, Mayo Clinic, what you're doing in this high tech, uh, do you really gonna need in our endoscopic suites on the future? Because uh, maybe pandemic takes some time to go or have to face another uh, challenge. Do you think that we are gonna start uh, and when we design our endoscopic suites, they will be we will be obliged to have the air flow control? Yes, and I think uh, in, that er in that area, endoscopy needs to head toward, to towards surgery more than going back towards standard procedural practice uh, because we are doing more and more complex procedure and the air dynamics in the OR differs from the same requirement in an endoscopy suite. So I think going forward, we cannot obviously refit all our endoscopy units for air circulation at this point. That's why we're trying to innovate all these strategies. But going forward, I think, uh, knowing what we know from this pandemic, we will need to design a airflow circulation congruent with potential pathogen being transmitted through aerosolization and through the air and enhanced air circulation within endoscopy units. So it means that the endoscopic world has changed it for good. And I'll leave with Santiago who has a comment, please. Yeah, yeah that, that, that was just a spectacular presentation. And, you know, we, we, we all do endoscopies all the time, and clearly we are very concerned about it. And, you know, we, I think that we have all been complaining that the endoscope did not change much in the last 80 years. And do you see a post-COVID-19 new endoscope that will have suction and insufflation at the same time uh, where, where you don't have to worry about that and really... Uh, uh, as Manolo was saying earlier, with with uh, endomucosal resections and poem becoming a, a standard of care, th those generate a lot of smoke. And, and, and with your presentation, we should be very concerned about that. Mm -hmm. Excellent uh, question, Santiago. Uh, uh, so uh, yes, I see a, a lot of development with scope technology. So what's the the theme of what's coming is what you're going to see is disposable scopes. So you could take the scope and test it away. Uh, that's one concept that's clearly coming uh, quickly. The other concept is you're going to see uh, scopes with better suction, irrigation, and evacuation tips uh, for sure. And the third concept that's coming along is scopes with accessory that are robotically assisted. So you don't need a full robotic platform, but you could have through the scope accessories that are robotic-like in motion to make our job easier. Uh, so I think these are all innovations that are going to come. And hopefully, we won't need to be battling with a poem or ESD in the future, because you could push in a button and ablate the, uh, the muscle of the esophagus without damaging the esophagus. And you could do a virtual myotomy uh, with something like electroporation. These are all concepts in the future that I think we look forward to uh, developing. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So uh, uh, we are approaching to the end of our wonderful webinar. And I cannot be more uh, happy and astonished with the things I saw. It's, uh, it's really uh, very comfortable uh, to hear you, Safi, uh, you, Abraham, Safi, speaking about that. The comments are bright comment as usual from Adriana and from Santi. Santi is a, our rock star. And I think Ariel, if you still hear us, uh, it is time you start to, uh, as you always do, finish with your charm and elegance uh, what you have been. <laughs> I want to thank you everybody for watching us. That was an incredible presentation. Uh, uh, 
everyone, uh, well, we just took it to the next level. It's impressive how the technologies have advanced during an era where uh, we could only see a grim future and suddenly all these things that we've been using for years, such as IBC, IBC has been using Zoom for the past six, seven years, and uh, we thought sooner or later it would catch on, and now everybody's doing online conferences. So I want to thank all our moderators, all our expert talks. They were spectacular. I want to thank all our viewers, and before I go, I want to remind everybody we have our World Congress coming up in 2021. September. And of course, if you like these webinars, please share them with your friends and colleagues. This is International Bariatric Club Oxford University signing off, not without leaving this message from our sponsors. Today we have Guy Miller from Advanced Medical Solutions. All right, tell us a little bit about the product. Um, liquid band fixate was the first device to be developed. Um, laparoscopic delivery of cyanoacrylate adhesive for the fixation of mesh in inguinal hernia repair. And it's designed to deliver specific drop of 0.0125 grams to the location of the mesh, where it then bonds the mesh to the tissue, intended as a replacement for the spiral tag. Um, polymerization occurs by coming into contact with moisture in the tissue. The adhesive turns from the liquid into a solid and bonds the mesh to the tissue. As mentioned, the cannula length is 355 millimeters. The tip is specifically designed to not bond to, to mesh or to tissue and to allow the management of any, any polymerized material at the end. The adhesive is held in a glass ampule in the blue lever. The lever is pulled back to break the ampule where the adhesive drops down into a little reservoir here and is pulled into the delivery syringe by pulling on the red tab. This pulls the adhesive through a filter, which filters out any glass, ampule, glass material from the ampule. And then you close the blue cover to make it in line with the steel cannula. Remove the rear red tab, rotate the blue dial at the back, so the trigger is released. That's pushed the adhesive down to the end of the cannula. And you simply press the trigger to deliver your adhesive drop. Wonderful. And I understand you have two types, one for laparoscopic, one for open. So this is the fixate open device. Again, no steel cannula this time, but we still have the tip that won't stick to mesh or tissue. Um, again, the difference here is the tip is projecting the adhesive to the side um, to make it easier for those blind applications. Um, and the tip will re remove a ball so you can then close the topical tissue, topical wound. The main difference here at this time, the ampule is at the back of the applicator, and it's a simple case of rotating the tip to break the glass ampule. Again, you can see the adhesive drop into a reservoir. You then push the plunger to transfer the adhesive to the delivery syringe, rotate that to close off the delivery syringe, and then you rotate this dial to prime the device. And again, this time you're just simply pressing the adhesive trigger to deliver the glue. To find more information about your product and your distributors, where can uh, our viewers go to? So if you go to our website, um, www.advancedmedicalsolutions.com, then there's a specific portal and page on our liquor band range of both topical and internal adhesives. And specifically, there's a section there for liquid band fixate. Um, you'll be able to find links to informative videos and instructions on how to use the device, but also on how to contact the company directly to, to purchase the device. Wonderful. Guy Miller from Advanced Medical Solutions, thank you for being on Spotlight on Industry. Yeah.